Doctor's greenhouse today? Is it that no, night? I'm in my TV room. Oh, okay. Lots of windows. Okay. All right, we're recording. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining our session today for our Arrowhead Intelligent Region Initiative. Again, today we have Robert Bell with us, uh, founder of the Intelligent Community Forum, and or as he always likes to say, a co-founder. I think they're all very uh, diligent in, in sharing the credit as well they should. Uh, exciting news today in Minnesota that the city of Alexandria, the Alexandria Lakes area, was named as a Smart 21 uh, Intelligent Thanks. Community, which is fun, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, Blandon uh, helped them become a, uh, submit their application now in uh, two years ago, and it uh, uh, percolated around in their ICF database, and, and this year they emerged as a, a Smart 21 community, so a very pleasant surprise for that. Today we're going to be talking about knowledge work, and uh, people have heard me present, always hear me say, well, you know, you just can't make a lot of money now lifting heavy things, which is what I used to do in college, delivering furniture and appliances, and uh, I suspect that the people doing that kind of work today don't make a uh, a whole lot more than what I did as a college student, and that was increasingly distant um, in my past. So uh, how does the community drive uh, the creation, attraction, and retention of knowledge work? We know that's on the agenda for uh, almost every rural community in particular, but really throughout the uh, uh, cities of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Austin, Texas, now San Francisco. And so it's uh, uh, something that's really universal in its uh, uh, importance. So uh, welcome, Robert. Well, thank you, Bill, very much. That's interesting. Boy, you just flashed me back to a summer job I had in a hardware warehouse, talk about lifting heavy boxes. And I remember I was the only person in, I was in college at the time, I was the only person you know, in there who was who was college track. And so it was a, it was a fascinating experience along with a lot of heavy lifting anyway. Okay, so let us share the screen and see if we can talk about this complicated topic and do it in a way that makes sense to everybody. Um, am I showing my screen? I'm showing my screen, thank you, okay. Um, so that's not gonna work, there we go. So last time, if you were with us, we were talking about connection, about connectivity and we talked about how to uh, really succeed in this game. If you are a, a, a um, municipal or a county government, you have to think like a telco and about think about risk reduction. And you have, there are a large number of options open to you for how you approach this, depending upon what your political situation is, your economic situation, uh, what you think you can actually accomplish without uh, igniting a backlash that'll stop you dead in your tracks. I talked about the importance of, of, of building a central office or data center. If you are already in the network business, um, think seriously about setting up your own small, doesn't have to be big, small data center because it's gonna have economic value far above and beyond what you might expect. Uh, and I also told a lot of stories about places from Loma Linda and uh, the York region to Dublin, Ohio, Parkland County and Bristol. So that was our, that's, those were our learnings last time. This time, as Bill said, we're gonna focus on knowledge work or work as we, in our shorthand. Um, and what we're gonna really focus on is first, is, as usual, I'm gonna tell you why I think it's important and why I think it's important everywhere. And then specifically what some communities are doing about it. And as Bill said, we are living in this never ending demand for ever sharper, broader skills and knowledge in jobs. Um, and it's, well, I won't say it's this guy's fault, but he's the one who came up with the word knowledge work. Uh, in 1956, there he was predicting already that, that just lifting heavy boxes was not gonna keep you in the middle class. And of course, that's what we've seen. 59, not 56, okay. And here, you know, again, a couple of just numbers that, that make it very, very clear. This is this particular charts from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2018. And it shows the weekly earnings by education Right, and what, what could be clearer? Less than high school, you're down at 500 bucks a week. 
you manage to get yourself an associate's degree, you boost that substantially to 836, you go to college, you get a bachelor's degree like I have, got about $1,100, $1,200, and on up it goes. Um, and you know, we've seen, we all are aware of this, but I still find it shocking whenever I see the disparities laid out this way. And even more to me shocking is this, from 83 to 2016, because of the way that we're running our economy, that the total share of US wealth of all overall, the belonging to the upper income among us grew from 60% to 79%, 80% of, of the US aggregate wealth is in the hands of upper income individuals. Where during that same period, the middle income share fell in, was dropped by 50%. And the lower income, which, you know, didn't have, <laughs> fell about the same amount, although it was a much smaller percentage share. So, you know, these are decisions that we made as a society that we were going to allow this kind of immense accumulation of wealth among those who already had and not care so much about the rest. And I think we'll, see, we'll probably see that turning around, but still it's being driven by the fact that there's enormous returns to knowledge and skills in a in an economy that's that's global. Um, Will Smith, the actor, first actor in history to earn a billion dollars. And all he does is stand in front of a camera. Uh, the author of the Harry Potter series, probably the first author in history to be worth a billion dollars because she, they both have been able to very skillfully tap a global marketplace that pays unbelievable dividends if you can possibly manage it. And it's just what we live with. It's kind of like, in the city of New York or in any of the other big cities right now, housing is unbelievably expensive, unbelievably expensive. And that's why people are fleeing actually San Francisco. Um, and why? Well, because they're home to industries with enormously high pay rates. It's finance in, in New York, it's software in San Francisco, and those folks can afford anything. So they just keep bidding up the prices, right? And that drives everybody else out. So it's a really tough, tough, tough world we've created with all this incredible economic success. So all desirable jobs require a higher component of knowledge, whether you're in an office, a factory, a construction site, a retail store, doesn't matter. They all have higher demand than they used to have. Uh, I can't remember what the statistic is, but the, a very, very high percentage of jobs can only be applied for if you are online. Uh, employees must apply knowledge and skills to add just enough. And this is one of the, this is one of those, uh, you know, we, we've had automation with us now for as long ago as the Luddites in England, who the, the folks who rose up and smashed the, the, the textile mills because they were terrified that the textile mills were going to put them out of business. And they did all that and it didn't do them any good because the machines ultimately turned out to be cheaper long haul to produce the same amount of stuff as peace, human peace workers were, even though they were paid so little. So today, as we have always had to do, we have to apply knowledge and skills to add enough value to justify the cost of employing us. Trick is that the, the uh, reach of automation has gone far beyond the factory now, um, far beyond the factory into all kinds of areas. From, you know, it all began with Microsoft uh, Office, right? All of a sudden, uh, administrative assistants practically disappeared uh, in, in, in America, except for just the, for the, the senior executive suite, as we're all supposed to be our own executive assistants now, because we've got the technology. That means your personal prosperity depends upon never stopping to improve your, your skills you have, whether you're doing that on the job or whether you're doing that in formal training. And here's the rub, right? This is places an enormous burden, an unfair burden on people who lack ready access to quality education, who lack the support of an educated family to give them an example, to guide them, and, and lack that there's all those enrichment activities that I was able to provide to my children when I raised them just because I'm moderate, you know, I'm modestly affluent. Um, this is a really raw deal and it's a really moral one, right? I think it's a really moral calling that we have in this country, but it's, it's everywhere because it's being driven by real things in the marketplace that we have to respond to. And of course, what this produces is rage. And those Luddites smashed those machines and it did them no good. And we right now have a just a kind of a revolution of rage of the people who feel that they are being excluded. They are being looked down upon by the elite. And you know what? They are. They're not imagining it. The trouble is that this doesn't get you anywhere except a sore throat.
And by the way, these guys are not really yelling. This is the shouting men's chorus of the city of Oulu, Finland. But, but that's just the fun part of this. So what are the cures? What can, what can we do about this? Um, the good news to me is that while this is a national, if not international problem, there's so many things we can do right at the local level, whether it's in our municipality or in our county, to change this. It just requires us to think differently. As Myrna put it, just thinking differently is your start. And so you need to rethink your educational assets. Of course, primary and secondary schools. Of course, a two-year college, if you're you know, fortunate enough to have one or more in your vicinity. Of course, universities, if they are either with you in your community or within driving distance. Those are obvious educational as assets. But so is local government. Local government is part of this because it's, it's they're representing the people, right? The people who are, who are paying for the education, the people who are being educated and the employment base of the community. And these are very often not kind of considered part of the solution and yet they are just as with the other things I've talked about, it's about the partnerships you build and how they can change what's going on in your community. So I wanted to tell you a story about a particular place um, and it's not necessarily representative of the Arrowhead region. It's the city of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, about 800,000 people, but and, and this and some other stories I'm going to share with you are about places larger, I think, than, than the standard or the average community in your region. And the reason I'm doing that for a very particular reason, because in these larger places, you can kind of see the whole picture. When you get into much smaller places, they naturally have to do things in, in a, uh, they can only, you know, do part of the solution, or they can grab this and bring it in and, and innovate on it and make a difference. But here you kind of see the whole picture that I'm that we're trying to explain to you and then you can make the choices about what parts of that picture fit your situation. So in Winnipeg, the story I want to tell is the, I'm sorry. Oh, that was just somebody that's somebody talking, no problem. In Winnipeg, I want to tell you the story of how the worst high school in the city reinvented itself to serve a very low income student population. Uh, it's called Sisler, and it was the worst performing high school in the city, and it was in a very low income neighborhood of the city. And Winnipeg is kind of a, a blue collar town with pretensions of being a lot more, a little bit, a little bit rough around the edges, uh, but you know, they're Canadians, so they're all friendly. So they, about 30 years ago, they acquired some new leadership, a new principal, um, you know, new, some new senior leaders, and they came in to change things. And what they decided to focus on was technology and employer partnerships to, to add to the standard curriculum. I mean, they didn't, they were not let out of the requirements to the, that are set nationally in Canada um, to educate kids according to certain standards, but they decided to add things to it because they thought they could, they could, thought they could, and they thought it would make a difference. And of course, this took a lot of work, and it's, this is just one phrase summing it all up, but it took a lot of work for them to find and partner with the Vancouver Film School, which they ultimately did. They actually taught the Vancouver Film School how to do streaming you know, presentations, streaming education. Um, that in turn led to, to relationships with executives at DreamWorks and Industrial Light and Magic. These are the two of the big production digital studios uh, in America. And they got integrated into the educational partnership. They went to their medical centers and, and were able to do a deal to get live streaming of surgeries from Winnipeg medical centers, as well as to connect with online activists in uh, environmental activists in Africa. So they're bringing all of this right into the classroom and opening the eyes of their students to what's possible. They're probably their single most impressive program is this one. And I, I you know, it's, I've never seen it anyplace else and yet Gosh, it seems like a good idea. They have a, a cybersecurity program. Cybersecurity, as you probably know, is one of the boom sectors of IT. There is an incredible shortage because the problem is, is horrific. And so this school came up with the idea of doing it, but they needed something. They needed um, actually a very sophisticated enterprise class network for the, these young people to learn on. And so in this low income community with a lot of dedicated teachers pushing hard, they were able to raise a half a million dollars. It's a lot of bake sales. Uh, no doubt they had a few you know, helpful larger donors, okay. but um, 
they, so they built this network and they use it to teach high-tech career skills in collaboration with, with companies. And the young people coming out of this, a lot of them are just employable right out of high school and they can get low level cybersecurity jobs and they get their employers to pay for their higher education. Because remember, these are not, these are not affluent kids. Um, and you know, how did they do this? I, I get a chance to interview the principal um, who's in his seventies at this point. And he said, how, how on earth did you do this? He said, well, I got a pretty simple approach. Uh, if one of my teachers comes to me and says they wanna do something I ask them, well, is that good for the students? And if the answer is yes, then he says, I tell, I tell them to go do it, figure it out. And so he unleashes this creativity of his staff in finding ways around the kind of problems and barriers they face. So because of all of this, this school has turned around and become one of the best performers, you know, not, not just because of these particular classes like digital media or whatever it is, but because the kids are connected to the future and they feel it. And they're now, they've got active arts programs. Act, I mean, they're, they're just doing extremely well because of this decision to give the real world a role in their lives, you know, instead of locking the students away and asking them to do something that to them was, you know, irrelevant because they didn't think they had a future of any, any significance. But this isn't just the story of one, one school because this is actually part of a much larger thing that Sisler here that has built partnerships with a, a local community college and a local mm -hmm. university and begun to try to break down all the walls that fall between them. So Sisler does its part by sending it, some of its students down to the elementary school grades uh, to get those kids and to do demos and show those kids what's waiting for them. So you're getting them really young and getting them excited about being in school. And if you talk about a, a strategy to attack the at-risk student problem, there's a great one. And just again, there, you know, the sizzle is always there. It's not just the, the good nourishing steak, it's the exciting sizzle. So they did a fourth grade digital media competition and got some executives from Electronic Arts, the world's biggest gaming company to come in and judge it, right? I mean, that's just, that's just very exciting even to a fourth grader. Um, on the flip side, They've worked really intensively with um, these, this community college and this uh, university to create some courses within Sisler that are university accredited. So their students can, their, their you know, leading students can complete their first year of university before ever graduating. Or they can attend university and college courses while in high school. They can, they can go to the campus and, and be treated like adults. And this is something that I I find this very passionately important because I, I had a, I have a nephew, a wonderful, wonderful young guy um, who really in his teenage years just got lost. You know, we were really afraid that he was going to go down the tubes on us. And what saved him was um, his school intervened and arranged for him to attend classes at a nearby community college. And the change for him was night and day. He, he, this angry young man, you know, who didn't fit in very well any place, suddenly was in, a, was in a, an environment where he was treated like an adult, expected to be responsible for what he did, but whose crazy ideas were welcomed as being something interesting to work on. And, you know, he's now got two beautiful children and he's married, he's also married. Um, and it's a wonderful life, right? Wonderful life. And it was that, that thing that turned it around for him. So we're rethinking our educational assets. How do these things connect in ways that are more productive and help us build the workforce at the same time we give a lot of young people a great education? Well, this is our map of it. And we, we call this the, the ladder of opportunity. Um, and you'll see all the players are here. Here's you know, elementary, secondary, college, and universities. You see the government is there naturally, and the, it's in the community. And the employers are there, but the relationships are all different. Normally, elementary, secondary, college, and, and university exist in silos. They don't really connect very much, even though they have such common interests. In some cases, you know, elementary and secondary are run by the same, if you will, school board or district, and yet, they're not really very connected. And of course, colleges have their own, usually, st usually state level um, organization of which they are part and universities very often are either state or are independent, right? So they don't necessarily play well together and they have to be convened and encouraged. And as usual in my, in my presentations, that's the job of the local or the county government or a group of them working together 
to say, we need to get cooperation going on up and down our educational ladder because we're making it too difficult for young people to get through this system and get the skills they need. And at the same time, you, the employer community, if you engage them as they did at Sisler High School, you take what is, can be, seem to kids an endless arid exercise in, in checking boxes and getting a grade and moving on into preparation for a life and, and in, in engagement in things that genuinely excite and interest them. And that's an incredible combination. And of course, the other benefit of all of, of involving your employer base is because your young people who are your most talented young people don't necessarily you know, grow up with the impression that they have to leave to get opportunity because they've seen opportunity. They know what's going on. And so you have the opportunity to retain more of your best talent while helping those who need more help to step up the ladder with higher skills along the way because they want to. And nothing is more powerful you know, in education than the student who wants, who wants to learn. And so that's really what this is all about. This is really all about in, you know, turning on that engine inside young people who, who don't naturally get there themselves, as well as creating fantastic up, upward mobility opportunities for young people who do. And then at the end of the day, hanging on to their talents and skills, because that's what's gonna power your economy. A couple more stories. This is from a smaller place than, than uh, Winnipeg. Oulu, Finland, where those, those shouting men came from, got about 188,000 people, which sounds pretty big, but they're spread out. And this particular city is uh, 200 kilometers from the Arctic Circle. So the fact that you see all this green here is nice, but of course, for most of the year, what you would see is a lot of white. Uh, very cold, very kind of remote place. They do have an airport, so that's their one connection, but they're, they're two hour flight from Helsinki. So they're, all, they're, all, they're up there. The reason they're there is because the wireless company Nokia uh, was founded there and got its start and built its, its operations and its research research facilities. And most of that has relocated, as is so often the case. Most of Nokia picked up and left, went someplace else. I think it may have been Helsinki. Um, but they left behind some research operations. And, and meanwhile, they, the community was challenged to figure out what it was going to do. So I've seen some incredible examples there um, of, of this climbing the ladder from elementary grades to local employment in this high-tech sector. And even though Nokia is largely not there, they have built quite a high-tech sector and they've done it piece by piece. So one of the great examples I saw is this thing, this thing called the Rit 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 Ritaharyu Community Center, except it sounds like, you know, sounds like town hall, right? Or a community center in your community, but it's not, it's a school. It has daycare, kindergarten, primary and secondary schools, school classes, but also a senior center because they believe that, you know, that's the way life is, is. it's multi-generational. So why not have a senior center there and a youth after school center? So there's a place for the kids to go before their parents get home. And they have, you know, tech is pretty much everywhere in the school because they know kids love tech and get excited by it. So they're partners with Microsoft in this partner in learning program as well as with their, their local university, which has this whole bunch of really interesting centers of excellence. They have one on the internet. And so IT and gamification is woven to every part of learning, even recess. They have digital kiosks in their playground, which is connected, which are connected to other digital key kiosks in other playgrounds in and around Olu. And so the kids like have competitive games with other playgrounds. It's, it's kind of hysterical to watch. They have a team teaching philosophy. You know, they're not gonna, no, nobody's gonna fail alone there. The teachers get together in cross disciplines. And their classrooms, you walk in, they're lovely, of course, they're light and airy. But in addition to the usual desks and chairs and, and all that stuff, they also got couches and armchairs and coffee tables in the corner because they think people should be comfortable while they're trying to learn. Amazing concept, right? Okay, so all of this sounds really nice and, and it's a model school. And I no doubt I was shown because I'm a, the, the, the judge, if you will, even though I don't vote, uh, I'm shown the best. But Finland leads the this accepted international student performance rankings that have been done for decades for 15 year olds in reading math and science. I do not think this is a coincidence. They have this notion of pulling it all together up and down the grade levels and, and turning learning into this really amazing, amazing exercise. And at the other end of this, 
education has become an economic development tool. Um, again, they have this university, which is, is got all these centers of excellence. So they, one of the things they did was a center for wireless, uh, center for excellence in wireless communications. And naturally they did that because Nokia still got its research center there. This center has cranked out multiple technology first and spun out multiple companies with global reach, which is all very wonderful. But when it comes to education, they're deeply embedded in this university. And one of them, just a detail I loved was Nokia and this research center has to occasionally gear up. I mean, they probably do it three times a year, gear up to do a production run of a thousand units of something. Well, where do they get their people to do it? Because they've got a small staff. They just bring in the students. And so the students get hands-on experience at high-tech volume manufacturing at the same time they get paid and, the, and, the, and they see again, they, they taste and touch a career um, that is exciting to them. And so this principle works you know, over and over and over again um, in many different settings. Final story comes from again, a fairly large place. Columbus, Ohio is the capital of the state of Ohio. Uh, it is a incredibly economically diverse city, has a very large um, low income black population, a um, couple of low, I can't remember what the, the countries of origin are, but, but uh, large immigrant populations that are you know, relatively new. Um, and also of course, sectors with a lot of money. It's the home to, to Battelle, which is a huge IT industry. It's an uh, IT and consulting company. It's home to uh, major universities and so forth. So it's a typical mix that you see in urban areas. But they launched a project which I, I still think is world-class and I think could be replicated in some way, shape or form pretty much anywhere where there are schools. They put together a city and state educational compact, a group, an agreement like the Mayflower Compact to ease the path of non-college bound students into higher education, to, to deal with that issue that if you're not gonna get uh, education after high school, you've made decisions that are going to control the rest of your life and they're not particularly good decisions. So the Central Ohio Compact is this consortium of its the school systems, K through 12, its colleges, its universities, its businesses, and its government. And it's got some very specific goals. It aims to double the percentage of adults in Columbus, the greater Columbus area with some kind of post-secondary credential, which means they're going to be doubling their chances of making a good living you know, through the rest of their lives. They're targeting the barriers that deny low income, lesser educated citizens, better employment. Those are very significant barriers, not necessarily in the outside world, but cultural and, and emotional barriers. And they're doing it by raising student expectations for higher learning. You know, we are all, I think, become aware of the fact that there are all these young people uh, from low income backgrounds who just, just, they just don't even think about going to college. In fact, my wife works for the college board, which runs the SAT, but does a tremendous amount to prepare kids for college. And, you know, their whole thing is if you're the first one in your, your family to go to college, you know, we want you and we want you to think that you can go to any, any school in America. Um, and we'll figure out how to help you do that. Making sure then that when they get there, they're going to be ready for that university, which is all about educational quality, of course. And then removing obstacles for adult learners. We're going to need to, you know, we're all going to need to keep upskilling. So how do we help people do that? And ultimately improving the affordability, because of course, in the US, higher education is just ridiculously expensive. And so, you know, they work on all those barriers, right? So just, a, and it's a big sprawling program and it reaches out into all these surrounding um, cities around them. But just a couple of examples, Honda has a very large assembly plant outside Columbus. And so they agreed to fund a program that lets students graduate from high school with an associate certificate, a college certificate in automotive tech, saving them two years of post-secondary school. And of course, you know, probably getting a job with Honda, but that's obviously not a sure thing. Right, so we've just taken away a really major barrier of expense and time if we can train you in, in high school, in your last two years of high school. Their state college there, Columbus State Community College, um, trains adult learners for careers in logistics and biosciences. Now, this is the end of a very large project in which they tried to you know, basically figure out what are going to be the growth sectors? And they came up with a list of five or six employment growth sectors and in really interesting industries like this, logistics and bioscience technology. 
And then the community college started saying, fine, we're going to actually create coursework for this for our students. And we're a community college. So we're a place that adult learners come. And again, very, very effective. You get out of this with an associate certificate in two years, and you've got a leg up that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And then multiple compact me members got together and did something that is, is kind of subtle, but it's pretty big. I mean, if you are, and then the thing they did was to unify standards across the two year and four, institu four year institutions so that that two year certificate would be automatically accepted by one another by a university for a four year extension. And then also they, they eliminated a risk factor that, that faces a lot of first time uh, college attending kids, which is I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go, go to a university and I'm gonna get my, gonna, my first year, I, I managed to make it, I got you know, successful. My second year was pretty good, that's super. I'm going to my third year and somebody in my family who's a major breadwinner gets sick, badly sick. And so what do I do? Well, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna drop out and I'm gonna go get a job and support my family. Well, what I just did was throw away two plus years of, of high cost learning that I got to ultimately pay for. So the system they came up with was you do your first two years, and of course they designed it properly, you get an associate, cert associate certificate right there, then, there and then. So you don't lose anything. You now still have that credential and whether you use that credential to get a better job than you could might otherwise have gotten, or whether you use that credential to come back in a few years and finish your university education, it works either way. So again, a completely unnecessary barrier that we've built that these folks have figured out how to get out of the way. So as always, I have some takeaways for you, right? We've got three examples. None of them I think are a perfect fit for the condition, the situations that most of the Arrowhead communities find themselves in. And yet things you can take away from them that I think are powerful. First of all, you know, this is an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, <laughs> We're dealing with education and education doesn't change fast uh, or when it does, it's usually for the worse. Unfortunately, we get some fad and we suddenly decide that it's all going to be new math so I can no longer help my kids with homework. Um, it's a matter instead of thinking deeply about what it is you have. And again, as I've said before, where are the influence points? How can you convene these players and get them to think about delivering educational products differently? And how can you think about giving them good reason to involve the employer sector that frankly would like to be at the table, but is typically not even asked. Now, remember, remember uh, years ago, I used to write children's books. And uh, I was invited into my kids elementary school several times to give a little, you know, presentation and lecture and I always made it fun and so forth. But they, and they called me Dr. Bell, which was great because I don't have a higher education degree. Um, but the demand was so immense. It was like, oh, thank God, you're gonna come in and do something new for us, right? That's related to, to something in the real world. That hunger is everywhere. This is about long-term partnerships, right? It takes time to bring everybody on board. Uh, it takes trust, which is a long time in coming. It takes shared understanding. It's well worth that investment, but that's the work to be done. It's not really just coming up with a program and, and you know, saying now we've won. Um, and it needs to do two things. It needs to target those disadvantaged learners by improving access, ambition, and giving their ambition to do it and having the support to get it done. Because if you don't have that educational support in your family and in your culture, you're gonna need a lot of help. While also creating advanced opportunities for the, the learners that you ultimately want to advance and don't want to leave you so you do that by again, bringing higher education into lower grades, doing, creating the stimulus activity that's gonna keep those learners moving up the ladder and becoming, you hope, extremely productive and happy citizens of your community or the greater region. So that's, oops, sorry. And that, that's our model for all of this. And now we get to the, the fun part of this, which is our discussion. So let me stop sharing. It's up here. Robert, you know, this past fall, we had uh, Tom Friedman speak at our uh, broadband conference. Oh, we, wow. I wish I'd been there. About the uh, pandemic is that speakers don't have to travel to come to your conference <sighs> of course. anymore. And, but he is a native Minnesotan and friends with uh, Al Franken and some other folks right. at uh, 
especially Bernadine as well connected to. Uh, oh, I'm envious Bernadine, Tom Friedman. Anyway, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, we talked about the book, you know, thank you for being late. And it seems as globalization, climate change and technology drivers of acceleration really apply to knowledge work. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Have you read that book? I started reading it and I was in a, I was in a, a pressured, bad mood time of my life. And I, after a while I said, oh, Thomas, it's too utopian. It's not that good, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll go back. Because okay. he's, he's always ultimately optimistic, bless him. Yeah, and it's uh, just a lot of overlap with what uh, uh, the intelligent community, he probably ripped it off, you know, it's the intelligent Yeah, community. yeah, he got it all from us, yeah. Well, you know, the, the big idea that I think is so applicable to what we're trying to stand up here in these, um, in these conversations that Friedman talked about there and in that book is this idea, he calls it an adaptive learning coalition. And yeah, that the yeah. best way for communities to be um, thriving is to be, um, to be have those, uh, that civic infrastructure so people can be responsive to opportunity and, and looking at the spaces that connect, like if you're talking about connect sectors together. So I kind of have that, I found that reassuring. I think that's what we're building here as an adaptive learning community to take, take a, uh, advantage of this opportunity, Robert, to think about how a broadband enabled economy and all of these six elements can advance us towards our vision for the region. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, um... I, I've, one of the things this work has taught me is, is the passionate need to think very clearly about how you get it started. Because you, know, you, can, you can outline the vision and you can show, tell examples of you know, how it can work, but then it always comes down to the local, how do I actually begin to convince people to, spend, to care about this, first of all, to spend time on it and to give it their energy, right? That's really... And, and that's the, what, what makes community, some communities successful. And it's usually because somebody's really ticked off and they want, they want to make change. Um, you know, you need those drivers. I, sometimes people will ask me, how do we get started? And I say, what you need to do is create envy. So you need to create a little pocket of incredibly visible success. And then all of a sudden, everyone will turn around and look at you and say, well, what, what are they doing over there? I don't know. What, what, the, what are they doing over there? You know, and that's how it starts. So... So again, I think the, the, that's probably in, something that's embedded into the Blandon project focus, right? That you're gonna create some success islands and people are gonna turn around and say, wow, can they, how did they do that? And then they wanna know. You know, we've been calling it, sorry, I'm gonna shut up now, please. Yeah, I probably should too as well, but the, uh, Sean Herhusky and I have been, uh, you know, certainly this uh, employer partnership and all these workforce initiatives how do you make education seem real? And it's, well, give a paycheck and a future seems to be a part of that. Sean, do you want to talk, you know, amplifying your comment about exhaustion, maybe of the business community or those partnerships or? Oh, sure. I guess one of the concerns that I have that I see is I'm on a ton of different committees and I'm on a ton of different boards and it's part of my job to be on these things. But a lot of times, when I go to these things, and as I'm looking at Carl and Whitney, too, as I'm looking at this, a lot of times I'm seeing, the and Betsy Olavanti, actually, I see um, many of the same people on each one of these committees, boards, such and so forth. Like they, um, a lot of times I'll walk into a room and, and eight of the 10 people this particular meeting were in my prior meeting. Um, so... I think there is something, especially in the business community that comes down to there is sort of an exhaustion. The fact that so many are engaged in so many multiple initiatives all at the same time with almost the same kind of people. And um, I, think, I think it does, especially if progress is slow, um, it, it can kind of wear out. And then it kind, of, it kind of wears out their engagement. And then when you ask them to go on to the next thing or to work on the next project, do the next initiative, they're almost hesitant to do so because their their time commitment has already been, you know, they've already been asked to participate on so much and do so much and donate to so much and participate in so much that they almost become hesitant to, to take on anything more. Sean, any solutions you could recommend? Uh, the only thing that I could recommend, honestly, is to one, you know, broaden our uh, broaden our ask to different groups and things like that. Uh, consolidate efforts if we can. I mean, that's pretty much all you can do. 
um, a lot of times you're working with the willing and the willing are the, the people willing to show up and get the meeting. So you do you, what, you know, you do what you can with what you got. It's, yeah, I call that I call, I call that the nifty 50, by the way. The nifty 50 always show up, but there's only 50 of them. <laughs> Sorry, go, somebody was speaking. So it, 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 yeah, this is, this is Michelle Ufford. I'm the, I'm the school business coordinator for the newly consolidated Rock Ridge District over on the range. And I was actually hired to create partnerships between our new school and the business community because uh, we're building a career academy school and at the foundation of that are very deep and deliberate partnerships with the local employer community. And just to the question about how, um, how you can help uh, employers um, you know, kind of efficiently connect, it's, it's my experience that we have a ton of enthusiasm over here on this side of the region from the business community for the new school that we're building and, and the whole concept around it. And I think one of the keys for the success of this is going to be making it as easy as possible for businesses to participate. Um, you know, most businesses would say they'd love to connect with schools, but they're busy and they don't have time and they don't have people who are dedicated to figuring out how to make that work. And on the flip side, schools say the same thing. They want to engage, but they don't have anybody. Um, I, I'm in a fairly unique role, although we've got um, a, a handful of others that do what I do here in the region, which I think is kind of unusual. Uh, but schools just don't have the personnel with the time or the expertise to make those connections happen either. And so it's, it's my personal mission as we move forward with this new school to devise ways of, of how, uh, of making it easy. How can we, um, you know, it's kind of a plug and play concept where an employer doesn't have to think about, boy, I have to create a whole new PowerPoint and what should I say if I'm presenting in this classroom? Um, I'll be developing that kind of infrastructure around making it as easy as possible. But I think the, the, the Two things that are key are having personnel that can really think about this and have time to make these connections, um, and then devising an infrastructure to make it as easy as possible. No, Just I think it's my two that's very no, that's very very well said. I mean, the the, the standard idea in, in change management is to identify the burning platform, as they say. You know, we, our platform's on fire. We better do something about it because otherwise we're going to end up in the water. The trick to that is that everybody's burning platform is a little different. Right. So employers have one, educators have another. And if you can find out what it is, the problem that you can solve for them that they're worried about, you know, they will carve out some time. But if it's just an exercise in having meetings, uh, yeah, that exhaustion factor is huge. I mean, you really, the only, the only cure for it, uh, as you said, Sean, I mean, literally the only cure for, cure for it is to figure out something that's really appealing to some, you know, new folks. And, 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 and that's the, uh, Michelle, I loved your comment. You need to be able to have the time to, to think about that, to work on it. Because otherwise, if you're just, you know, so busy doing, going through the motions of doing, it's really hard to make progress. Exactly. And really the one advantage that a huge advantage we have right now from the educational perspective in, in engaging employers is a very real existing and looming workforce shortage. And so there's a vested interest for employers to get involved with their educational system. I think that's what's driving a lot of it right now is the fear that they don't know where their future workforce is coming from. Mm -hmm. And we all know here in the Northeast region, at least here on the range, this crazy myth persists that's, that, that there's nothing here worth staying for. And parents are advising their students that as soon as you graduate, you better get out of here, kid, if you want to be successful, which personally drives me crazy. I've got over mm -hmm. 20 years in workforce development, and it's my personal mission to change that narrative. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're frightened. And so I'll let the educational system come to their aid and be part of their solution. Uh, but we need to be able to make it easy for them to do so. Well, and, and just, I'm sorry, somebody else want to jump into this? Cause I, I just think you've raised two really brilliant ideas. I do the, the, the making it easy. That really is the heart of it. And my, my experience, both running programs myself and watching other communities is that you really have to approach it as a trial and error thing. In other words, we're gonna set out, we're gonna, we know that our first iteration of this is gonna be clunky and inconvenient and you know, not very effective, but we're gonna start on it. And then we're gonna to try to get the people who, to, who we think we're trying to serve to reflect back to us what's wrong. You know? And then we'll keep refining it and refining it and refining it until it becomes this nice smooth machine, you know, and I, I have run a lot of programs and there's, when they're successful, there's always that moment when you go, ah, oh, finally, finally, we've gotten out of our own way and we're delivering the value to people in a way that they can actually consume it. 
and make you know do something with it. And it's um, yeah, it, I, I don't think there's a magic answer for any program. I think you just have to keep experimenting. And I think one of the key things to avoid exhaustion is speed. You know, mm. if you have a committee that talks for six months before doing something, you know, let's say there's a shortage of cybersecurity people, entry level, then you know, instead of having a committee to think about it for six months, hire a cybersecurity teacher and give 20 kids the opportunity to go take cybersecurity training at little to no cost or whatever, then it, sometimes we plan too much and uh, wait too long. And then that does exhaust people. I know that manufacturers for them, meetings are the enemy. And, and some, some people uh, like myself get paid to go to meetings. So it's, you know, that's a, a kind of a culture clash that, but the sooner we've learned through our bland and broadband and the Iron Range broadband communities that the fast you can get people working on actual activities that provide benefit, you know, the happier everyone is. And so to that point, I wanted to kind of remind people that the so what of this meeting is the opportunity to think together. We tried to create this space here together about, so how can we respond to this opportunity, you know, have that workforce lens on us and moving towards in the next couple of weeks here, a you know, chance to really do some project ideation and development. What, it would, what would it look like? Who are the partners that wanna in this space with these um, IRRR resources and Blandons do something in this space? So we're hoping that this, is that this conversation today will fertilize that thinking together for you know, what can we do together? This is a real pregnant moment for us. One thing I often hear from educators is, and Michelle, I'd be interested in your point of view on this, is, you know, you have to remember that when we're designing curriculum, you know, you don't just slap something together and put it out there. You've got to get it accredited. You've got to, you know, there's, there's things you have to do that I, I know a little bit about. And one of the things that really impressed me about the Sisler example was that they very carefully steered their way around that. Everything they did was, was kind of an elective, you know, it was an extra thing. Uh, and it was ultimately the electives that drove the educational excellence of the place. Um, so Michelle, have you run into that as a barrier? Um, no, actually, we, it hasn't been a barrier quite yet. So the, the, um, the, the new school that I mentioned is a ways out yet. It's being constructed as we speak. And we've just consolidated two districts, Ebba Gilbert and Virginia. And so we're working through that process. But we really hope to start instituting some of these career exploration uh, and um, pathways programs in, in our existing schools before that new school opens. But where we're really finding some great uh, traction is with the employer community uh, advising about what we should include in that curriculum. And so we're holding a series of these advisory committees uh, to talk specifically about the topics that we should be including in say a health science course or a business course or a marketing course. Um, so we're really getting our uh, a bead on current industry trends and what's important right now, as well as uh, industry recognized certifications that we could be offering at the high school level that could could lead to a pathway directly into the workforce after high school or that would supplement some post-secondary training in a particular field. And the reality here is that education and businesses speak two very different languages, two very, very different languages. And so you really need a translator, which is, which is my role. Um, and frankly, I'm kind of learning how to speak uh, education speak, which is a whole different world. Uh, but bringing those two things together, here's a, a case in point. I had a principal ask me yesterday, uh, we want to engage the business community in uh, what our, what we're, what, what our ideal graduate looks like, our portrait of a graduate, what we want our graduates to look like in terms of skills and abilities and competencies by the time they graduate. And she was asking me about, well, let's ask the uh, business community about what kind of schedule we should have to accommodate their time. And, and I said, hey, they don't know a thing about schedules. They don't want to know a thing about schedules. We need to make sure that we're using language that makes sense to them. Um, and then we translate that internally uh, and how that works for our system. But, it, you know, it's a language barrier. It's, it's like um, asking somebody in France the Greek words they want to use with their new Greek neighbor. And, and, and who knows? We don't know what the answer to that is. But being sensitive to that uh, language barrier, I think, is key. 
It's, thank you. I, I, it's, it's a, a point I make, except you made it from a great base of knowledge. So thank you. <laughs> Robert, this region has a reputation for trying to attract knowledge workers. Do you have examples where that's been a successful strategy? Well, there's a number of rural areas that have what typically are called, kind of called lone eagle programs where you're trying to attract, um, you know, trying to attract individuals who can basically live anywhere and get well paid to move into a, an area that's best known perhaps for tourism, right? So um, we were just, interestingly enough, we just uh, did an event and one of the speakers was a guy who was a, had a 30-year 30, 30 career in uh, tech tech entrepreneurship, but obviously made some money and decided to move to this particular lovely place, Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. And of course, being who he was, once he got there, he started getting engaged in, in giving back and he's established programs to build a community of people like him um, and who are starting tech companies. So in this place that is a, a tourist destination, they, they suddenly have got like several hundred, well, suddenly, they now have several hundred, you know, Real small to mid-sized tech companies that have sprung up. Okay, so yeah, it 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 can be done, but it's, it's you know it's a it's a it's a one it's a one by one kind of effort, right? You gotta you gotta do it one by one to get enough people into a critical mass, so that then it begins that innovation ecosystem, which we'll talk about next time, begins to turn. It's always it's interesting to me that that. I've done a lot of these classes like this, on, you know, live, and and the I've gradually come to realize that most of the people who come here have got all kinds of wonderful skills and qualifications, but there's very few educators. And so when it comes time to have a group discussion around this, people don't, you know, they they sort of don't know what's going on in their school systems. I mean, why would they? Except beyond the fact that they may have parents, be parents, and have kids in the schools. Um, so it can be a little difficult for folks who are not in that world to kind of bridge across the, the divide that Michelle's, you know, has a job crossing. Um, I wish there were more people with your, your, uh, your job description, Michelle. Well, let's create that. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, a, Actually, I think it's a, go ahead. So one of the things uh, just, just, this might be too, too fine of a point on, on the matter, but so in this role that I have with the, with the school systems, I, I still technically work for a workforce development agency, the Northeast Minnesota Office of Job Training. And I maintain that relationship instead of just jumping ship to the school entirely, because I do believe that there's a whole system out there uh, in the workforce development system that can act as a translator across the state between districts. And we've got offices all across the state. Um, we understand uh, employer needs. We have employer networks. We know about um, effective career exploration processes, preparing for post-secondary training. And this is information that does not reside in the traditional educational system. And so to me, it, it makes infinite sense to try to align these systems. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to do at Rock Ridge is to demonstrate how that can be done. And so I am documenting everything that I do in my position so it can be shared with others across the state uh, who can hopefully find ways to, to work together and break down some of the silos we have, the ridiculous silos we have between these large public systems. Interesting. That's fascinating. Because there's, as, you know, there's workforce development everywhere. Right. Across the country. But, right. But it, it doesn't, I don't know, my experience of it is it doesn't connect with education that much, which is kind no. of strange. Well, we're going to fix that. All like good. Mission. <laughs> good. At least here. Robert, one of the least intelligent things societies do is to ignore the talent in the people in the disability community. And I know Myrna is a big advocate. Do you have any lessons learned for her as she does her That's work? A good one. That's a good one. Um, most of the communities I've, we deal with, I mean, it's, it's sort of always on the list, but it's not it's not a huge factor. I mean, the, the, dis, the typical disabilities, interesting enough, we run into are, are things related around age. So people you know, get to an age where they're, they're not being able to function and they don't want to, but nonetheless, you want to find ways to keep them engaged in society. But that's not quite the same, you know, not quite the same thing. It's tough, Myrna, because it's, you know, you're, it, people with disabilities are there, they're significant, they're, there's, but there's not, you know, that many of them, I think, and they're all different. They've all got different issues. 
And of course, for cultural reasons, we, you know, we've all preferred to pretend that you're not actually there. So it's rugged. And it is a problem because of usually the last ones called to the table, but the ones with the, um, the most to gain from new technologies, especially the autonomous um, vehicles, because we can't get driver's license like the rest of you can. And um, yeah, there, it is a big concern. I wear a hat. I am an educator, um, retired educator, besides being um, on four wheels now instead of two feet. And um, it, I really think workforce development needs to begin in the schools. I think our young educators, um, I've got second graders over in Deer River where we started the program in the middle 80s that are doing robotics. And that needs to grow. That needs to, the minds of our young people need to think different and um, into a, this wonderful world of technology. And, and um, broadband is essential for our young learners and our people with disabilities because that's our voice. Technology mm -hmm. is how we get, how, how we connect with the world. And so um, um, closed captioning, we need to pay more attention to people of all different abilities in uh, how we communicate with everybody. Technology can do that, but it's not doing a very good job. It's mm -hmm. not doing it quick enough and it's not doing it. We're not getting technology to the right people in my mind. Of course, I, I'm a big advocate for uh, differently able people, but technology is a real key that can make that happen. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, yeah, so it's, no, I mean, uh, it's funny, differently able, different situations, but this is not exactly related to what you asked Bill or you talked to Myrna, but one of the more impressive little projects I've ever run across is in Australia. It's an, a program called Ask Izzy. And in this case, we're dealing with people who are homeless and they have a significant homeless problem because their uh, housing costs are accelerating. And so they did a survey and discovered that 80% that of the homeless community that they were serving had smartphones because you know, it's kind of an essential tool. And so then they came up with an app that's called, it's called Ask Izzy. And Ask Izzy is what you go on to to find out anything you want. As a homeless person, it's your guide to the city. It's what shelters, where are the shelters, you know, what's the capacity in them right now, where are various services. It's got a, a, a digital vault that you can arrange to get your birth certificate and your other essential uh, documents scanned and loaded into. And so it's very much an example of, of you know, people with a different situation from the rest of us getting served with a technology just made to order to help not to change their lives, but to help them live their lives. Uh, and it's the principles, you know, it's kind of outstanding when you run across it. Well, just the apps that are available now that you can find out where it's accessible. I have people saying, why do you still live there when nothing's accessible? Well, it's getting better, but technology is, is helping people find out where those places are accessible. And uh, with, with, I mean, those kind of tools only need to be expanded because, you know, education is power and technology has the ability to make education even more powerful. Hmm. Well, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> I know, that's a problem. <laughs> it how is a problem. Get, how do we get outside the choir? That's just it, but trust and, you know, it's not with, you know, blame and dame and, you know, those kinds of games. It's with, you know, um, when it becomes personal, when you need it, that's when you want it. And uh, I didn't realize how many wonderful new things are on. I've got a wheelchair now that will stand me up so I can, uh, um, I can have lots, lots more opportunities, but, you know, if I wouldn't have been in a wheelchair, I don't know if I would have cared. Um, so when technology becomes personal, when it's something that you can see makes your life better, look at all the grandparents that can visit FaceTime or Zoom with their grandkids anywhere in the world now. You know, we've got to make those people not in the choir already join the choir. You know what? There's a song, all God's creatures have a place in the choir. Um, there you go. 
That sounds good. I think maybe next time we'll have Robert uh, play us a video of that uh, Ulu chorus. That might be fun. the shouting men's yeah. chorus. Shouting men's chorus. It's. I, I get to see it in person. I was invited into this room and I didn't, nobody told me what was coming. And then these guys come in in these black suits and white shirts and all line up and look at me. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And all of a sudden they start shouting. They're, they, they, since I'm an American, they have a, a number they do, which is the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and they scream it at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes uh, for policy changes in action, you need some screaming. So exactly. we have to uh, create our broadband Screaming chorus. You Whitney, go. you're the leader. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. We're past time. And and uh, like everyone else, the two, 159 comes and people have to click on their next link to their meeting. So thanks for staying with us. And uh, our next uh, session is Tuesday at uh, 1 o'clock. And Mary, do you know what our title is? Um, I might have it up. You'd like to think I would. Hang on a second. <laughs> so one second. Uh, it is first, innovation, ah, building yes. the ecosystem for growth. Great. Yeah, it's a big title. Okay. Good. Well, it'll be fun. Ties to work for us. So thanks, everyone. Thank See you, everybody. You Bye. Bye. Bye.